everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion. Can you hear me okay? Everything all right in the back there? Great. Uh, my name is Jack Hughes, and uh, I have the privilege of being the chairman of the board of the National House of Hope. And I'm going to attempt to be the moderator this morning, although controlling this group is well above my pay grade. <laughs> But uh, we are going to talk today um, about teens, about some of the issues facing teens, and some of the solutions and help that's out there for them. Um, I have my uh, roving reporter, Deborah Maffitt, in the back there, who will uh, wander around and take questions from the audience when we get to that point. Uh, what I'm going to start out with is just asking the panel if each of them would do a, uh, a quick little intro of who they are and uh, what they do and what their specialty is. And uh, then we'll start with some questions for them. Josh? I guess that means I'm first. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my name is Joshua Straub. I uh, work with the American Association of Christian Counselors. I'm the senior, developer, senior director of professional development. Um, I'm as confused about that title as you guys are. So. Um, basically, that just means I do whatever I'm asked to do, um, especially in the area of building research, um, publications, um, anything from booking conference, booking speakers for conferences, doing a lot of PR stuff, that sort of thing for the American Association of Christian Counselors. And of course, our president, Dr. Tim Clinton, will be here tonight uh, doing the keynote address. And uh, so if he says to do something, I just pretty much do it. So that's what my title means. Um, and uh, my specialty area is um, primarily in the uh, attachment research. Uh, my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation was in God attachment and romantic relationships. I've also done a lot with the millennial generation, speaking uh, actually with Dean Staver here um, at Values Voters and with uh, uh, the awakening event that he holds on millennial generation and how to message and mobilize millennials and uh, to engage them particularly in the area of how to connect, uh, how to help them connect and truly do relationships well. I've also um, recently been doing a lot of research and study under the tutelage of my cha um, a dissertation chairperson, uh, Dr. Gary Sibsey, in the area of neuroscience and, and brain uh, chemistry and brain research. And it's been um, just very en enlightening, especially as it relates to teenagers and how to connect with teenagers and help them think on higher levels. And um, Sarah and I will be actually talking about that in tomorrow morning's session. So, um, so that'll be good. So anyway, that's a little bit about me, and I'll pass it on. I'm Matt Staver. I'm the founder and chairman of Liberty Council, which is an international nonprofit litigation, education, and policy organization. We have offices in Florida, Virginia, Washington, D.C., and in Israel, uh, as of just uh, recently. And uh, we advance religious freedom, life, and family. I'm also the Dean and Professor of Law at Liberty University School of Law with Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Hi, I'm uh, uh, Eric Scalise. And uh, I, along with uh, Josh, uh, work at the American Association of Christian Counselors. I'm the Vice President of Stuff, um, <laughs> occasionally known as the Vice President of Piles. And, uh, <clears throat> Rarely the vice president of piles of stuff, but anyway. <laughs> uh, enjoyed being with you yesterday. Um, I've been in the mental health field about 30 years. I'm a licensed professional counselor, licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, served as the uh, program chair, uh, department chair at Regent University counseling programs for eight years. And uh, had a lot of, uh, uh, spent, my wife and I who's here, Donna, uh, we spent uh, four years working with inner city youth at, uh, in San Diego, Youth for Christ, and setting up uh, uh, child abuse programs in for incarcerated youth uh, was some of the things we did. And, um, you know, in, in uh, God, I say we, we raised two teenage boys, identical boys, who are now serving uh, this country as Marines. So very proud of them. Very so good. we got through the teen years, and so maybe we can share a few thoughts that way. <laughs> Hi, I'm Donna Rice Hughes, and I'm the wife of Jack Hughes, and that's one of my That would jobs. be me. That's, that's Jack, and um, I've actually known Sarah and been part of the House of Hope family. I consider them a family. 
um, since, golly, I don't know, it's been about 16 years now. When Sarah was on our board, I'm the president, the CEO and the president of Enough is Enough. And Enough is Enough is a national organization dedicated to protecting children and families on the internet. And I got involved with that in 1994, before the internet had really become commercialized. And we saw at that point sexual predators and pornographers beginning to use the internet, um, bulletin board services and news groups to um, distribute uh, the worst kind of pornography that, that we had ever seen, very hardcore material as well as child pornography and also sexual predators using those bulletin boards and news groups to start to interact with one another. And that was a whole new phenomenon, to share, porno to share, to share child pornography, to share how to molest kids, to share um, how to avoid law enforcement detection. In fact, I just did an interview with CNN a couple of days ago on a bulletin board service that was just brought down. It's the largest child porn uh, pedophile ring ever. Uh, over 600 members, three based in Virginia, um, where the kids were under 12 years old. And, um, and part of membership was to create new child pornography. And everyone thought, oh wow, this is so horrible. And I said, well, you know what? When I first got involved, we saw something very similar to this. You know, so this isn't anything new. Um, but that said, I've been involved in that issue for a very long time. And, um, and just recently, not just recently, it's 2011, <laughs> this goes back to 2004, we actually found that in spite of all the efforts that we've um, made legally, um, as far as the laws in this country, trying to get our laws prosecuted to protect kids on the internet, um, getting the technology industry involved in creating tools and that sort of thing, that still the most important thing that we can do to protect our kids is to empower parents, grandparents, and um, teachers and other caring adults who are actually touching children because they've got to be the first line of defense. And because of that, we created the Internet Safety 101 program for adults. I'm going to be talking and speaking from that and teaching you about that program tomorrow. So it's not just going to be cyberbullying. Um, so I just wanted to say that. But um, so anyway, um, that's, that's a little bit about me. And, and I, can I just tell a, a little story about you, Jack and Josh? Um, I was just had the privilege. Jack and get, Josh? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't know this yet. Uh, I, I but, don't know where she's going with this. But, but, but. I was, um, I had, yeah, Josh knows. Um, I was just down um, doing two webinars for AACC. And I hadn't met Josh before. And we're hoping that we're going to have a nice partnership here with AACC. And, um, and so we spent two days together doing two webinars and the whole thing. And after we were done, and I'm just feeling high, you know, because we've been working really hard. And so he comes up to me after the second webinar late at night. It's like 10 o'clock. Like, he's going to give me this big, gigantic hug. And, you know, they're on this board together and everything here at House of Hope. And, um, and he says, you know, it's just been such, so great, you know, working with and getting to know. And I'm thinking, oh, how sweet of him to come up and say that. Your husband. <laughs> I'm like, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> so there you go. I, I have no comment because anything I say will incriminate myself. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you all for that. And um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with a couple of questions for the panel from up here just to get things kicked off. Uh, we would like this to be interactive as we go along. so. You know, as they talk about some of the issues facing teens today, um, think of questions that you might want to ask them while we've got this uh, brain power up here in front of us. So um, let's uh, kick it off and then we'll uh, have Deborah go from table to table and force people to ask questions. Um, so let me start off. Um, there are a lot of issues, as all of you know, who are involved with, with Houses of Hope. You see it every day. A lot of issues facing the teens. Um, the panelists mentioned some of them here, um, but but one of them seems to go to, um, you know, how does the teen create their identity? Where where are they finding their identity these days, and and how does that come about? And what are the things that that kind of uh, influence that, or get in the way of that, or drive them in a different direction uh, than? certainly parents or adults would hope they might go in. 
Eric, if I could start with you on, on the topic of identity, if you would kick us off, give us your thoughts on, on what's happening with that. We'll let a couple of the other panelists kind of chime in, uh, and, and then we'll take it from there. You know, I think all of us, um, you know, the identity issue is something that all of us wrestle with. And, you know, one of the things I've seen with today's young people uh, comes as a result of the vacuum that is there from good role models, uh, both within the family structure and within societal structure. And, and, and the media loves to define uh, what is valid, what is um, good, what is healthy, and what is positive, and it's obviously not always a Judeo-Christian viewpoint. You know, one of the things I've seen is that, you know, when it comes to identity issues, uh, People often define who they are by what they do and whether or not people accept or reject them. And so if people try to define who they are by what they do and what they do is not good or people tell them that they fail or they perceive themselves as failures, then they have an identity problem. Or if people reject them for who they are, and it's not always acts of commission, like abuse or domestic violence. Sometimes it's acts of omission, simply an absent father. Uh, four out of every 10 live births today, I think I said this yesterday in my talk, um, are out of wedlock births. And so young people, and it's higher in, in minority um, cultures. Um, and, and so young people grow up sometimes wondering, who am I, who loves me, what is my purpose for? And yet I think in all of us is a God-given desire to be significant. I think that's part of our God-given creative DNA that's inherent in man. And so people, young people grow up confused and they try to sort out their identity and they lock on to the media icons and the media standards and value system to define who they are. And I think that's why we're beginning to see, not beginning, but we have seen you know, for some years now, some of the problems that we see uh, in, in culture. And Josh, if I could ask you to perhaps give your view on, on that same topic, please. And uh, just to echo uh, what Eric just said, there's one question, and this is apart from attachment and the questions that we're asking in, in, as it comes to relationships, but there's one core question that all teenagers are asking, and that one question is, how am I doing? And, and they're looking everywhere to get that question. And there's two fallacies. Did you ever? Uh, the first one is the spotlight fallacy. Have you ever spilled a, uh, a little bit of coffee on your shirt, and 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 you're trying to get it off, and and you walk around and you think everybody in the world is gonna stare at this one spot of coffee, right? This is what teenagers do. Okay, they have this. They they believe that the spotlight is on them, and that everybody is looking at them, and so that's the that's the lens from which they view their world. So all eyes are on them. The second thing is the brush fire fallacy, and they believe that you know, if you have a little bit of a brush fire and there's a wind, you know, what's gonna end up happening? The brush fire, if it's dry conditions, the brush fire is gonna take off, it's gonna become a wildfire. And they believe that about themselves, that if they give a little bit of who they are to somebody, that they're gonna take that and they're gonna spread it. And it's gonna spread and it's gonna spread, especially in middle school and high school and, and, and you, amongst peers, that, that everything that they say about themselves is gonna be exposed to the world. And so as they ask this question, how am I doing? One, they think all eyes are on them, and two, they think everybody in the world is talking about them. And, um, and so th they go and, and they develop their identity in this light. And with, like Eric was talking about, with today's media, I, I mean, with technology in the past 10 years, I mean, 10 years ago, we were running with CD Walkmans, right? And, and we were worried because they were skipping all the time, and you were trying to figure out how not to get your CD to skip. The technology is growing so fast, social networking is growing so fast, that now, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen in the research, there's a new term called Facebook depression. And Facebook depression, it, it stems from this question, how am I doing? Facebook depression is looking at everybody else's profile, because you're going to put your best image up on this Facebook profile. You're not going to put the bad pictures of you, you're not going to put 
the bad things about what's going on in your life. You're going to put everything that's good. And so when I'm looking at your profile and I see that you're living a good life and I know I'm not living that kind of lifestyle, it creates a depression within me. And so what ends up happening, there's this new term now that researchers are studying called Facebook depression as an actual condition because it stems from that, how am I doing? Well, I'm not doing very well compared to everybody else.